torsional elements are the elements that are subjected to torques. But let me first introduce what are those elements, and after that we talk about the equations that we need to determine stresses and deformation in those elements, okay? I'm going to start with this simple example. I guess that every one of you have used screwdriver before. Screwdriver is a sort of torsional element. The torque comes from our hand, and it's passed through the shaft of that screwdriver all the way to the screw. There are some other elements that may make sense for you. For instance, this wrench or this one. In all these cases, we are applying a couple. A couple means two forces equal in magnitude opposite in direction. In that case, they are producing a moment. This moment is twisting this shaft or that pipe. So that pipe or this shaft is subjected to a torque. This is example of torsional element. Or this one. Assume that there is a motor which is supposed to transfer the power that is generated from this motor to somewhere else. The power that is generated in the motor is transferred to this belt by this shaft. So generally, I would say that torsional elements are used for transmitting power from some point to another point. Another example that many of you are familiar with is vehicle. Almost every single one of you are driving vehicles on a, on a daily basis. There is one important element in the vehicle. It doesn't matter if you have a nice vehicle like that or an old vehicle like this. In all those elements, there is one important part, which is called driving shaft. And that shaft is responsible for transmitting the power that is generated in the motor in the engine all the way to the wheels, either the front wheels, the back wheels, or all the wheels that that we have on the vehicle. That element is subjected to a torque, okay? Let me show you another example. So once the engine is rotating, as you can see, the, the middle shaft is subjected to a torque. Another example would be this one. Again, this, is, this derailing shaft is something that many of you have used. So derailing shaft is another example of torsional elements, okay? So this part is the part that is getting the power from the drilling shaft and transmitting that all the way to the body that we want to drill the hole in. Another example which is similar to that, but in different scale. Do we have anyone from petroleum engineering? Okay, so this is an example that might be interesting for you. Once we want to drill a, drill a hole on the ground, we use the same concept, but in a different scale. The scale might be as large as this or even larger. And this shaft is again subject to torque. Another example for civil engineer is drill a tunnel. The tunnel used to be uh, excavated by hands, but not anymore. There are some huge machines that are used for drilling tunnels. Some of these tunnels are huge. For instance, the length of this drilling machine is about the length of a football field. You can see part of this and compare the diameter of this drilling machine compared to the height of the, the engineers in that tunnel. So all of these elements are torsional elements. In torsional elements, similar to the axially loaded elements, we are basically looking for two main things. First, how to calculate stress in those elements. Second, how to calculate the deformations in those elements. Assume that we have this torsional element, a very simple case, like we have a shaft, a circular shaft, which is subjected to just one torque. So there is one important thing happening here, and that is once I apply torque in that element, the cross-section area of that shaft is not changing. It is circular at the beginning, and once I apply the torque, let me show that again, it remains as a circle. So there is not any change on the cross-section of that. So in our class, in mechanics of materials, we just work with circular shafts. The equations that I'm going to develop is not valid for rectangular shafts or any other shapes. On the lecture notes, you can find the proof of the equations that I'm going to use today, but I ignore the proof of those equations, and I will just introduce what are the equations that we need for the calculation of stress and deformations. First, 
I'm going to talk about the calculation of stress. We may notice that stresses are zero at the centroid of the shaft, and they are linearly increasing when I get away from the centroid. It means that the maximum stress occurs on the outer surface of the shaft, as shown here in this video. And the equation that we use for determining stress is this one. Shear stress is Tc over J. Sometimes, instead of this equation, I use T rho over J. They are equivalent with each other. In some textbooks, C stands for the, larger, the largest distance from centroid, and rho stands for, as shown here in this figure, that stands for the distance of a certain point from the centroid. But because we usually look for the maximum stress, we usually look for the largest distance from the centroid, which is the largest radius. T is the torque that is applied on the section. C or rho is distance of the point at which we want to determine stress from the centroid of the shaft. And again, this equation is just valid for the circular shafts. And J is the polar moment of inertia. So for determining stresses, first we need to determine how much is the torque. And for determining the torque, we need to use the free body diagram. So once we determine torque, we also need to determine what is the polar moment of inertia. Who remember what is the polar moment of inertia? I'm hoping that you remember what is the moment of inertia, right? This is what we have learned in statics. Polar moment of inertia is simply moment of inertia about the y-axis plus the moment of inertia about the x-axis. So sum of the moment of inertia about two perpendicular axes. For circular shaft, the equation is simply pi over 2 radius to the fourth or pi over 32 diameter to the fourth. We usually, as an engineer, we usually work with diameter because we can easily determine that. But these two equations are equal to each other. For tubular shafts, for hollow core shafts like this, the polar moment of inertia would be simply pi over 2 external radius to the fourth minus internal radius to the fourth or pi over 32 external diameter to the fourth minus internal diameter to the fourth. As you may notice, I simply deducted the polar moment of inertia of the whole out of the polar moment of inertia of the entire section in the tube of sections.